From a and &E, this is Biography. For June 29th, 1998, Biography with Peter Graves. Hold it! He was a national monument. A man who inspired presidents and ordinary citizens alike. On screen, John Wayne was the ultimate tough guy, the very definition of manhood. But what you may not have known was that off screen, he was among the most generous people in Hollywood. Wayne's image and his politics were powerful enough to polarize a nation, especially during the Vietnam era. To many on the right side of the political spectrum, he was emblematic of American strength and true grit. And to the left, he represented militarism and arrogance. When Wayne starred in a pro-war movie called The Green Berets, the New York Times called it vile, insane, and false. But no controversy could diminish his appeal. In a 1994 poll, 15 years after his death, Americans ranked him as their second favorite movie star. And the next year, he came in first. Tonight and tomorrow, biographies look at the man who was in every sense a giant and whose star power continues to grow. To understand his enduring appeal, you only have to see a John Wayne movie or talk with one of his fellow actors. Well, beyond question, beyond argument, he is the absolute all-time movie star. There was an energy about him, and there was a danger about him, too, you know. You knew you could push him just so far. He was a real man, real man. He liked life, and he liked making movies. America, 1907. It was the time of a rough-riding president, of a vanquished people, and of an immigrant's dream. It was a time of scientific discovery, of first flights, and of tamed frontiers. In the heart of the Midwest, on a land once teeming with buffalo, America found its destiny. It was here, in Winterset, Iowa, that John Wayne was born as Marion Robert Morrison on May 26, 1907. His father, Clyde, was a well-liked pharmacist who was known for his generosity and good nature. His mother, Molly, was a domineering woman who was unhappy with her husband's lack of ambition. His father continually lost jobs, moved around in Iowa. His mother was somebody who wanted success and resented the fact that the father was unsuccessful. And so they were quarreling all the time. In 1912, the family grew to include a second son, Robert. But Clyde's poor health caused mounting financial pressures that overshadowed the joys of a growing family. Heart trouble and chronic asthma forced Clyde to close his pharmacy and declare bankruptcy. The resulting tension in the household was not lost on little Marion. He began to suffer from insomnia and ran away from home more than once as his parents' arguments became more heated. In 1914, the Morrison family moved to Palmdale, California, where the ever-optimistic Clyde hoped his health and his luck would improve. He swapped his pharmacy work for homesteading on an 80-acre plot of land owned by his father. But most of California's fertile farmland was already taken, and what he found was an arid patch of desert that would be difficult to farm. After two years of this desolate existence, in 1916, the troubled Morrison family packed up and moved to Glendale, California, a small community on the outskirts of Hollywood. But relocation did little to solve the family's financial problems. As his parents struggled to make ends meet, Marion learned to be self-reliant and took a morning paper route to pay for his school clothes and help with some of the household expenses. Though the family remained in Glendale, mortgage foreclosures and eviction notices forced the Morrisons to move eight times in only five years. The constant moving made it hard for young Marion to make friends. Insecure and something of a loner, 
He was especially self-conscious when it came to his name. Uh, it was a sissy name. And he took a lot of guff from his peers as a child over that name. So he spent a lot of time alone. Marion's best friend was his huge Airedale dog, an oversized companion who would offer a solution to his most troubling predicament. The dog's name was Duke, and uh, they used to stop by a fire station, and uh, the fireman began referring to Big Duke and, and Little Duke, so that name stuck. I think he was delighted to escape the Marion label. Eleven-year-old Duke relished the attention and camaraderie of the fireman who had given him his new name. Brave and sturdy men who faced trouble head-on and risked their lives for the safety of others. It was these same traits that Duke found compelling in the silent movie heroes he watched at the Glendale Theater. Saturday afternoons would be spent riding beside his cowboy idols, men like the roughshod Harry Carey, a lone spirit who fought for the common good and prevailed against all odds. Living only miles from the heart of the film industry, the star-struck boy could also watch his hero's exploits in real life. When Hollywood studios brought their casts and crews out to film in Glendale's Verdugo foothills, Sometimes the film crew would even let Duke do small jobs around the set, and afterwards join the men for a box lunch. In 1921, 14-year-old Duke entered Glendale Union High School. By now, the wiry boy had shot up to nearly six feet and was maturing into a handsome and athletic young man. In school, he blossomed. He was developing into a good-looking boy, so the girls liked him. He was an athlete. So the boys liked him. This sort of loner quality uh, disappeared, and he, he won acceptance and developed some self-confidence. You look at, at Duke Wayne's uh, high school yearbook, he's president of the Shakespeare Club, he's co-captain of the football team, he's, uh, he's the leader in everything. He's in the drama club, he's in this, and he's in the French club, and then he's in that. I mean, the guy was an uh, all-American high school, all-star, you know, the all-American kid. After graduation, Duke was more determined than ever to make something of himself. With his family still in financial trouble, it was his physical assets rather than his good grades that offered him the opportunity of a college education. In 1925, the burly athlete was awarded a football scholarship at the University of Southern California and began courses in pre-law. Joining the Sigma Chi fraternity, he agreed to bus tables and wash dishes in exchange for room and board. The six foot four athlete became well known on campus and enjoyed the wild parties and special attention granted to football players and fraternity men. His good looks and good manners also made him popular with the ladies. During spring break of his freshman year, he met Josephine Sands, a young Spanish-American beauty who came from a world very different from his own. Josephine came from a family that was very well placed in the Hispanic community in Los Angeles. Her father was a diplomat and then they came from a pretty high social status. The couple began to date regularly and the two soon fell in love. But sophomore year brought tough times when a shoulder injury sidelined 20-year-old Duke for the football season. Unable to play, he was cut from the team and his scholarship was revoked. With the prospect of a free education now gone, Duke took a job at the William Fox Studios for $35 a week. His football coach got him a job at the old Fox lot on Western Avenue. And he was working as a prop boy. You know, he's a big guy and could carry sofas and, and whatever needed being carried. Always a team player, Duke enjoyed the camaraderie of being part of a film crew and developed a reputation as a hard worker. He even attracted the attention of John Ford, one of Fox's star directors. Usually gruff and irritable to newcomers, Ford was disarmed by Duke's confident and easygoing manner, and the two struck up a friendship. Well, I think the first the connection was football, because my granddad had played uh, high school football. 
And also, the guy's the most attractive, likable guy who ever lived. He's absolutely charismatic, even at that young age. The athletic prop boy was soon rewarded with occasional jobs as a stuntman. And his good looks brought him work as an extra and bit player. In 1929, his friend John Ford even gave him a speaking part. As a midshipman alongside another USC football player, Ward Bond in the Naval Academy drama, Salute. You ever been to the movies, mister? Sure. What do they do in the movies, mister? Why, they neck, sir. He doesn't mean the audience. What do the actors do, mister? <laughs> Duke also caught the attention of Fox director Raoul Walsh. Walsh thought that the wholesome young man might be perfect for the lead role in his upcoming widescreen western, The Big Trail. With Wayne, he saw this lean, very graceful, tall man, and he wanted to pit him against rougher types as a kind of uh, symbol of good in this movie. Though studio executives were hesitant to cast an inexperienced actor in Fox's biggest production of the year, Walsh was persuasive, and Duke was offered the starring role in The Big Trail for the modest salary of $75 a week. With his movie contract came a new All-American name, chosen for him by Winfield Sheehan, Fox's head of production. At 22, Duke Morrison became John Wayne. We're taking on a new scout. Guess again, Flack. I started with this outfit and I'll be with it at the finish. Who says so? I'm just telling you. There was a kind of sweetness, the kind of prairie innocence of him, and the kind of idealism. Marion Morrison was familiar with reinventing himself. The shy, skinny boy who became the strapping and popular Duke knew that his determination and charisma could take him places. But little did the 22-year-old know how far he would go and just how difficult the journey would be. You're watching John Wayne, right here on Biography. Biography's look at John Wayne continues on a and &E. Filmed in a new 70 millimeter format called Grandeur Pictures, The Big Trail was hailed as Fox's most ambitious picture of the year. But just as the movie completed production, America's economy was plunged into a deep depression. The tremendous crowds which you see gathered outside the stock exchange are due to the greatest crash in the history of the New York Stock Exchange in market price. October 29th, 1929, the stock market crashed. Banks closed and millions lost their jobs and their life savings. When The Big Trail was released in 1930, only a handful of theaters could afford to play the widescreen film. The picture failed miserably at the box office and drew little public attention to its greenhorn star.